When all is said and done and the final nail has been drilled into the coffin of TNA or whatever it's calling itself this week, the obituaries will make for interesting reading. For a short while, TNA provided a genuine alternative to WWE when it came to North American wrestling. It had a fantastic roster, separate, well-defined divisions and truly exciting in-ring action. Unfortunately, the promotion also had a tendency to snap up recently released WWE talent and past superstars that were way beyond their best. Oh, and let's not forget this knobhead. Throughout its tenure, TNA has had countless wrestlers on its hands that could have made a true difference, either by committing to getting behind them or by treating them differently. A core cool roster could have emerged that would have continued TNA on its positive path. This didn't happen though, and TNA became synonymous with all that is bad about pro wrestling. Still, for every Pac-Man Jones, there's been a Matt Morgan, and for every Val Venus, and Alex Shelley. With that in mind, I'm Adam Wilborn from What Culture, and these are 10 wrestlers TNA completely dropped the ball with. Number 10, Alex Shelley. I bloody love Alex Shelley, but he's never quite received the assistance from creative teams that he deserved. This was especially true in TNA. They flirted with Shelley as the X Division champion, having him win the belt in 2009 by defeating tag team partner Chris Sabin, only to lose it very quickly afterwards to suicide. Alex Shelley is a fantastic in-ring performer with the microphone and character skills to back it all up. Why he only got a cup of coffee X Division reign is beyond me, lads. Shelley and Sabin experienced a decent amount of tag success, but here was a single star just waiting to explode. Number 9. Daphne when TNA made its ill-fated move to Monday Night Programming in 2010, and ho oh, ho, that went well. Anyway, Daphne caught a few fans' attention. There was just something about her, the intangible X Factor, that made her stand out from the pack. Daphne had a different look to the rest of the knockouts and carried a totally different aura. She was more than capable in the ring, too, with her attacks seeming more vicious because of her aesthetic. TNA could have done a whole lot more with Daphne around this time. She was another option TNA had if they wanted to present a real alternative to WWE to offer something different. Ha ha ha! No! She was severely injured towards the end of 2010 and was given a whole lot of nothing to do on her return before finally just being given the boot. Number 8. Okato Right, so my therapist has told me not to get wound up about these sorts of things, but how do you f*** up Kazuchika Okada? One of the best wrestlers in the world today, a multiple-time IWGP heavyweight champion, and a man who makes Michael Sidgwick feel things he just doesn't quite understand. Anyway, in TNA, Okada was presented as Okada. Well, he was Okada for a while, primarily losing in dark matches, but at the beginning of 2011, Kazuchika started dressing as Kato from the Green Hornets and was nonsensically involved in the awful Samoa Joe D'Angelo De Nero feud. Needless to say, New Japan were angry and their relationship with TNA was soon ended. A year after returning to New Japan, Okada defeated Hiroshi Tanahashi for his first IWGP Heavyweight Championship. Figures. Number 7. Mr. Anderson Whilst it might go against the entire point of this list to include a former TNA champion and someone who is expected to get a rocket up the arse from WWE, I still think our point can be made. Mr. Anderson was a strange talent, a Marmite performer in professional wrestling, to say the very least. He was capable of producing fantastic matches, and when he was on his game on the microphone, he was as good as anyone in the company. Anderson actually got two runs with the top title, but both lasted just a single month apiece. Anderson was convincing and popular in the anti-authority role, but frequent turns and the nonsensical motives derailed him. Anderson did a whole lot of nothing in his last couple of years with the company before leaving following a supposed failed drug test. Number 6. Matt Morgan Another former WWE wrestler who really came into their own in TNA, Matt Morgan was seemingly continually on the cusp of greatness there. He was an easy-moving big man who could give promos for days and had 
unreal strength. Despite teasing it on oh so many occasions, TNA just refused to pull the trigger on Morgan as a monster heel champion or high energy babyface champion. In his six years with the company, Morgan didn't win a single championship and his story arc seemed stuck on team with other singles wrestler, split up, feud. Matt Morgan was a great talent that TNA just didn't believe in enough to get behind. Number five, Desmond Wolf. Whenever Desmond Wolf's name comes up in the same subject as ball dropping, many are quick to jump and point at Wolf's injury issues that eventually, of course, led to his release and retirement. I would argue, however, that TNA had long since messed up what they had with former and current Nigel McGuinness. They seemed to do everything right to begin with. Wolf went straight into a feud with none other than Kurt Sodding Angle. The two put on some genuine classics too in the process. Wolf then transitioned into a feud with the Pope D'Angelo De Nero. More on him in a moment. But it seemed that whatever faith creative had in him had been lost. This was all but confirmed when it was clear that Ric Flair was putting together a new Four Horsemen-esque group and Wolf was the only individual to fail to qualify. Instead of leading to a hot feud against the newly formed heel faction, Wolf started a team with Magnus. The team had promise, but Wolf was forever tainted in TNA's eyes. Oh, and Desmond Wolf was also the unlucky recipient of TNA's complete unwillingness to listen to their fans. A championship ranking system was installed, allowing fans to vote on who would get TNA World Championship shots. Ahead of such assumedly popular names as Kurt Angle, Jeff Hardy, AJ Styles and Sting, Wolf led the poll from start to finish. His title shot came, but it was over in a flash. Number four, D'Angelo De Niro. At the same time as things started floundering for Desmond Wolf, they started exploding for the former Elijah Burke, D'Angelo De Niro. The Pope was on fire, seemingly transforming overnight from a heel feuding with suicide to the most on fire babyface on the entire roster. Pope's congregation was growing quicker than Pope could print money. All of which led to a feud with AJ Styles over the TNA World Heavyweight Championship. De Niro defied the odds to get into the match and everything seemed set for him to win the belt at lockdown 2010. As it was, Styles won the match and that was that for Pope. He would turn heel later in the year, going on to have ridiculous stories with Samoa Joe and brother Devon and just became another hot talent simply left by the wayside. Number three, Jay Lethal. The same as many other names on this list, TNA flirted with the idea of truly getting behind Jay Lethal but ended up being too afraid to properly pull the trigger. Lethal would go from big story to nothing. To big story to, yeah, nothing again. He was stuck doing an impersonation gimmick for the most part, a state of affairs that he somehow still managed to turn into gold. If you wanted an example of a truly effective way to book a pro wrestler, look no further than Ring of Honor's treatment of Lethal. The company made a conscious decision early on to get behind him and give him a sustained push, which led to him becoming a dominant world champion and one of the best wrestlers in the world. I bet he still does a sweet Ric Flair impression though, eh? Number two, Generation Me. You may know them as the Young Bucks, or simply put the best tag team on the planet today, but Matt and Nick Jackson also had a short tenure in TNA as Generation Me. The brothers had a single tag feud, admittedly over the titles with the Moe City Machine Guns, before heading into singles competition. TNA then decided it would be a good time to split the brothers up and have them go at each other in singles competition. Needless to say, yeah, it didn't work, and the two were reunited, only to be left with a whole lot of nothing. The Bucks eventually left TNA in less than pleasant circumstances, with Matt stating that he almost quit pro wrestling altogether after the experience. Thank God that didn't happen. Even back in 2011, the Young Bucks were a true breath of fresh air in TNA's tag team division. They were ahead of the game in terms of high octane offense, and TNA really dropped the ball for not making them an integral part of that division. Number one, Monty Brown. When the words TNA and drop the ball are used in a discussion, the safe money is on Monty Brown's name coming up in the chat. Brown was the first big organic star that TNA had on its hands. Their own product who was really getting some momentum behind him with the crowd. He had the look, the charisma, the promos, oh, and 
the finisher. He was more than acceptable between bells. But all that was kind of a little inconsequential because the crowd loved him. Brown was unsuccessful in challenging for the top title in the company, but it seemed that his time would soon come. Well, anyone believing that needed to head back to the drawing board, as Monty Brown decided that the best way to deal with his lack of title shots was to cozy up to the champion, Jeff Bloody Jarrett. Yeah, TNA did to Monty Brown what it truly does best, turned him heel for no sodding reason, killing his momentum dead in the process. Also, the irony of TNA dropping the ball when it comes to a former American football player is whew, really not lost on me. And that's our list. Did we miss any out? Let us know in the comment section below. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And subscribe to What Culture Wrestling on either iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from for daily wrestling podcasts. Plus, you can check out some more recent videos here. Thanks for watching. I've been Adam from What Culture, and I'll see you soon.